Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As a British born Muslim who has the honor of serving in a British cabinet, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to London. It is my pleasure to welcome the World Islamic Economic Forum to London, the first time outside the Muslim world. And it is my pleasure to be part of a historic day of announcements led by my Prime Minister, David Cameron. We are just 13 years into this young century. And in that short time, we have seen that the old economic certainties have been turned on their head. First, in terms of financial stability, when we entered the third millennium, economic systems seemed sound, secure, and assured. We thought financial crashes were just grim chapters in history books. We were even told that there would be no return to boom and bust. And yet in 2008, we were plunged into the biggest recession since the Second World War, with markets collapsing, commodity prices rocketing, redundancies, bankruptcies, and terrible, terrible tough times for millions of people. The impact was so huge that we are only just beginning to set foot on the path to prosperity. At the same time, the global map of economic power was being redrawn, with new markets emerging. Britain found itself in a global race with new powers like Turkey, Qatar, and Indonesia. T now 10 of the world's 25 fastest growing economies are in the Islamic world. Their rapid rise is staggering. And back in 2000, 24 of the Fortune Global 500 companies were based in emerging city economies. But by 2025, it will be 230. That's nearly half of the Fortune Global 500. In the 80s, when my father set up his own manufacturing business, if you'd told him then that in just three decades, some of his biggest competitors would come from China, he would never have believed you. Nor would he have believed how technology has reshaped the world of business, how science has, committed, has connected communities, how it has empowered consumers, linked businesses, and made a very large planet a whole lot smaller. Now, there is no denying the extent to which the global economy has changed. The question is, what role can governments play? Well, as a center-right politician, I don't believe it's the job of government to create business, but I believe it is the job of government to create the conditions for businesses to grow and to thrive. And as an avid cricket fan, let me put it like this. As a politicians, we're the ones who need to roll the pitch to create the perfect wicket to allow you to bowl the Yorker and hit that six. And I think the UK government has chalked up an impressive tally. Easing regulatory restrictions, cutting red tape, curbing interest rates by cutting the deficit, supporting venture capitalists, fast-tracking entrepreneurs' visas, making corporation tax the lowest in the G7, leading internationally on trade tax and transparency, and restoring confidence to show clearly that Britain is open for business. But let me fly the flag for my department, for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, because it is the government's secret weapon. When it comes to rolling the pitch and creating the conditions for business, we are right there creating the relationships upon which business is built. And as someone who comes from the world of business, I know that it's not just about good products and about good prices, it's also about good relationships. My ministerial colleagues and I use our role at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as a platform to create, enhance, and solidify our international relationships. Every overseas visit is a potential opportunity for British business. It's commercial 
diplomacy, because trade is based on trust and fostering lasting friendships creates the backdrop for business. It was 18 months ago on a visit to Indonesia and Malaysia that I was convinced of the potential for the growth of Islamic finance. And I made it a personal priority. It's why we set up the first ever ministerial-led Islamic finance task force, and it's been a real privilege and pleasure to lead it. And from Malaysia to the Gulf, banging the drum for Britain, one thing comes across loud and clear. That the Muslim world wanted Britain to enter the capital market with an Islamic bond, a sukuk. And it wanted to see an Islamic finance market that never sleeps. Now, there were many that said this could not be done. But with pragmatism, political will, and dare I say downright Yorkshire stubbornness, I'm delighted that Britain has committed to becoming the first country outside the Muslim world to issue a sukuk. Islamic finance, ladies and gentlemen, should matter to everyone because everyone can reap the rewards of a stronger, diversified, ethical economy. Napoleon once described Britain as a nation of shopkeepers. I take that as a compliment. It demonstrates our country's resourcefulness and our commitment to trade. But I would add to that, we are a nation of shopkeepers, of manufacturers, of entrepreneurs, of engineers, of designers, of developers, of academics, of inventors, and now, alhamdulillah, Islamic financiers. And we are very much ready to do business in a changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Baroness Fazi. Lots to get thinking about. We're going to have a really exciting panel discussion now. I'm, I'm Juliet Mann. I'm a broadcasting journalist and business correspondent. I've worked in newsrooms around the world, notably for CNN, Sky News, and for Reuters. And I've mainly covered business and economic stories, so that's why I'm really excited to be part of this session on doing business in a changing world. Now, here's what we, we already know. As Baroness Varsi said, the old economic certainties have been turned on their head. The world economy is still in disarray five years after the financial crash. A recent UN economic report says developed countries are expected to show the poorest performance with about a 1% increase in GDP. Developing economies are likely to grow by nearly 5% and transition economies by 3%. Oh, and a couple of weeks ago, the IMF trimmed their forecasts for global economic growth. These are forecasts that show a world economy being patched up, but never really returning to that rude health, unless politicians take difficult decisions at home to improve economic performance, but also coming together globally for a more balanced future. In other words, what happens next is uncertain. Perhaps we should be asking whether Western financial models can withstand future onslaughts, whether they're even fit for purpose. These are the things that I'm hoping we're going to talk about and more with four people whose businesses have survived and often thrived despite all the economic problems. Now, you might have noticed we only have three gentlemen here right now, so I'm hoping that our fourth will arrive during the, the, the next few minutes. Let's see. If not, we've got an esteemed panel here for you. Let me introduce you to the gentleman we have here. We have forward thinker, Sheikh Khalid Ali Reza. Now, he's the vice chairman of Zenel Industries. But he's also chairman of the board of several large publicly traded industrial companies in Saudi Arabia. He does lots of philanthropic work and has an award of commendatore, which is an Italian order of merit. You could say that business is in his blood since he's descended from one of the oldest trading houses in the Middle East. Now, Zenel is made up of more than 50 companies offering operating in four continents. He's got many international firsts to his name as well, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a few of those during his remarks. Now, Zeno was, has built companies and fostered expertise, bringing economic growth and development to the many places in which it invests. And it's internationally connected to many large corporations all throughout the world. 
next along, we have the Tottenham Hotspur fan, Tanstri Asman. He's the CEO of the Sovereign Bank of Malaysia, the managing director of Kazana National Baha, so the treasury, the strategic investment arm, if you like, of the government of Malaysia. He's also the chairman of Iskandar Investment Bahad and Axiata Group Bahad and holds various board memberships. He serves on several public service bodies and is a member of the Board of Trustees of Asia Business Council, the INSEAD East Asia Council and the Global Agenda Council on the role of business for the 2011 World Economic Forum. In other words, he has great contacts. He's got great experience and he really knows his stuff. And on the end there, we will hear from Adam Ismail Ibrahim. He's the CEO and CIO of Oasis Crescent, a wealth management organization he established in 1997, which I'll tell you wasn't the best time to set up a new business. But the goal was to provide a global platform for the ethically conscious investor to protect and grow their wealth in a relatively low risk manner without sacrificing returns. Now, Mr. Ibrahim works with his two brothers, so he offers prudent investment choices that are Sharia compliant. Now the band of brothers are pretty low key, they're not at all flashy. You won't find these guys pocketing huge bonuses. And maybe that's a leadership mindset that we can expect, expect to see a little bit more of. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Now today, Oasis Crescent offers an extensive product range to suit all investor life stages and services clients in 41 countries globally from offices in London, Dublin and South Africa. He's going to talk about the massive growth opportunities in international trade. Well, now you're more or less briefed, so let's switch up a gear. Over to you, Sheikh. I have been uh, well introduced, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I take this opportunity since my uh, co-speaker is not here to speak for, uh, to say that he uh, has managed to convince me to buy a Range Rover, not himself, but the quality of the car. Um, I uh, want to give my talk a little bit, uh, some flavor, and I will not be like the previous panel and speak from cloud nine. I'll come down to cloud five initially and then come down even to cloud one and talk to you about specifics of experiences that we've had in the Zenel Group and in the region. But also, ultimately, we'd like to address the issue of um, what, how to go about handling the situation in these troubled times and um, give you some recommendation to the GOST uh, gathering here of what should be the future of um, of uh, to displace what has failed. Since World War II, the global economy has been going through turbulent times. Uh, the first marked and influenced by politically, by detente, Cold War, and between East and West, with the third world suffering the consequences. The, um, this reminds me of a saying that, that um, I think was uh, concocted in Africa, actually. When elephants mate, grass suffers. And we in the third world have suffered quite immensely during the first half of uh, the last 60 years, odd years. Um, Economically, there were two camps, communism and capitalism, and both extreme end of the spectrum and with major ideological differences causing huge barriers between them. And hence, these major binary disruptive forces influence business strategies, planning and decision, making it relatively straightforward to plan and forecast to be done by economists looking at the past and projecting the future. Wrongly, I might add, until they adopted a new philosophy of on the one hand and on the other hand um, theory. Uh, communism during this period failed. 
the 80s, saw the end of the communist period, uh, more or less, except with China, who tried to dabble with both. Um, uncontrolled, unfeathered capitalism flourished and is now failing. And I'll give you further uh, understanding of what's happening. In the past 15 years, however, coinciding with the failure of the two systems, new disruptive forces, I didn't know how to measure it other than give you an expression of uh, Richter scale, varying from six to nine on the Richter scale, have occurred making it very difficult for, to predict the future for businesses. Um, To name a few, but not necessarily in the order of importance, as importance will uh, vary from, from uh, one uh, to another industry, from one geographical area to another. Uh, I'll, I'll rattle through the uh, various forces that have occurred, digital revolution, techni te technological revolution. In fact, the last 15 years, saw more development in technology than in the previous hundreds of years that took place. Y2K, do you remember it? That, that was a, a shocker for many. Uh, so was the dot-com era. Um, and let's not forget 2001 uh, with the terrorism act in, in this, sadly in New York and other places in 07 in England and others, that has shocked the world. Uh, reaction to terrorism was even worse than the terrorism itself uh, because government hunkered down and started acting more, um, more capriciously, more controlled, more making it impossible for business. Um, the uh, uh, Expansion of China has come about in the last 15 years, making, um, making the uh, commodity prices shoot up. Uh, I'll give you an example. Copper went from 1,500 to 7,500. Um, the expansion of India um, with IT hub transferring much of the manpower requirement of the world to India and therefore causing unemployment in many countries who didn't see this coming. Um, WTO was a shocker in itself as it introduces new uh, level field. Um, uh, currency fluctuation, the end going up 35%, going down 35%, gold shooting up to $2,000. Uh, Irresponsible energy uh, policies adopted by the United States where uh, ethanol fuel was used, uh, was made at the expense of food, food shortage, HIV, and everybody will speak about the financial crisis, which is a, a major shock and not just a tornado. Energy. Um, Shortage and costs, the price of oil, you know, shot up to oblivion. Um, not to forget the environment and the weather and the international disasters, social unrest, political unrest, bloody revolutions, especially in my part of the world, and deforestation. I would like to say something on, on behalf of uh, Prince of Wales, who has advocated that that car more carbon is footprint is per annum is uh, utilized, uh, consumed um, in, uh, in deforestation than in the whole of the transportation industry, whether it's coal, gas, or oil. Um, oil and gas fracking is a new thing that is going to cause a new uh, uh, disruptive force. And the last uh, that I want to mention here is the massive excessive rules and regulation. Th th these are cause, all these things are cause for 
or loss of trust from trusted institutions. And trust, uh, once it's lost, it's very difficult to gain and causes slower economic velocity and transactions. Not all of these negative uh, in going business, uh, but some positive tends to be on industry and geographical region. I promise you I'll finish. <laughs> That's one thing, I, whether you kick me out or... <laughs> I, I will be more explicit to the effect it has on us in the region and as Zainal as a group. The digital revolution, um, when I was visited in 1995, Chang Ling Tian, the uh, chancellor of Berkeley, came to see me and I parted with, from him with a word of wisdom saying, either be online or perish. Well, therefore, we in Zainal had to adopt uh, the new t ERP system, MySAP, enabling uh, decisions to go uh, where it should be, down, and management to be flattened with top management monitoring and, con and coordinating. Number th we reduced processes and cost, and most important, knowledge and transaction of our products and services are within the reach of the ultimate customer. Um, the negative threat, I just would like to say that there is a negative threat uh, to business. In the past, a one-eyed one man was king. And now, with the internet and Google, everyone can become king. The world has flattened for individuals and companies. China factor up, upon us was very effective, uh, and so was the political situation, so was Iran, so was the Arab-Iraqi war and, the, and terrorism and WTO, causing the price of oil to go up from $20 to $110, amassing a tremendous wealth, almost two trillions in, um, uh, in the uh, Gulf and oil producing nation. Saudi Arabia alone has about $900 billion. Uh, therefore, government expenditures in the Gulf has skyrocketed and causing immense, uh, immense boom activities. At the same time, China accumulated $3 trillion, uh, allowing purchasing power and, uh, of commodity and from the Gulf to buy uh, petrochemical aluminum uh, from the Gulf particularly. Hence, major orders with healthy margins allowing major expansion. Um, the uh, the Zenal Group, as its industries, were able to expand three to four, to three to five times to, uh, to allow its industries to become well scale, to invest in core businesses worldwide, namely Italy, Turkey, India, the Gulf, to name a few to become a world-class competitive uh, and to uh, have a critical mass in its industries, reaching its strategic ob objective. Uh, the big shocker that's coming is shale gas and shale oil. Gas in the US and Canada is going to replace coal for, for, for uh, power plants. Saudi Arabia, was, which was going to become the hub for petrochemicals, is no more. Now, petrochemicals have to immigrate to America, and we as Zainal will have to move to America to, uh, to invest there. Shale oil is a more shocker for all of you because it's going to be very effective over the next 10 years. The dominance of oil, uh, price of oil and uh, OPEC is going to change. The premium factor, the premium political factor for the Middle East turbulence is approximately 30 to 40 dollars is going to gradually disappear in time. Uh, hence, excessive foreign reserves for oil producing nation will dwindle. 
However, on the positive side, um, one billion car that is today in, in the market will, will go up to two billion cars by the 2050. That's according to uh, the chairman of Shell I, in a private conversation. So I will not, uh, I did not verify this myself. The financial crisis uh, and, uh, caused tremendous havoc and halted international financing, virtually no supplier financing for commodities, reducing working capital for, our, for companies around the world. Basel III, with most banks uh, flush with cash, uh, have to adhere to, therefore, reducing working capital again. Um, many people recommend that a leader and a and a manager has to be a juggler to survive these turbulent times. Others, uh, however, I personally expect a leader and a manager to simulate himself with a Formula One car racing driver to speed on the stretch, speed, uh, slow down on the curve, and accelerate when visibility is clearer, keeping an eye at all times with nasty accidents that can happen and wild corners, ensuring that his car is lean, mean fighting machine. As for the company, that it, is nimble, it should be nimble, cohesive, diversified, effective, always reviewing and planning for an exit strategy or what you call plan B or and C. One, one I hate to interrupt, and I, I'd love it if you could hold Tom a bit back for okay, the Q&A okay. that we get to. And well, I love what the you... The ultimate goal... Why didn't, you talk, why didn't you tell us what you thought about yes. institutions? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, this is the next one. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate goal is not winning the race, but keeping himself healthy and his car in the best of shape, as there would be other races. Um, the last card. I promise you, you will not go to sleep with it. <laughs> As for this conference and for this august gathering, I recommend that since communism has failed and now capitalism is following suit, an alternative econo economic system has to be adopted. And may I suggest Islamic capitalism, which is capitalism with a social conscience and with a, an ethical regulatory bounds should be adopted. Ethical, another should be ethical banking, known today as Islamic banking, replacing usury banking, uh, which was introduced in the 18th century in Italy. And I'm so glad that uh, Prime Minister Cameron announced his, uh, his uh, um, action to become one of uh, the first um, non-Muslim country to become um, to become on the forefront of uh, Islamic banking and uh, Sukuk. Although there are some say there are three million Muslims in this country and can be this country can be classified both Christian, Muslim, Jewish country because of the population that exists. And uh, Prince of Wales has advocated he is the defender of the faith, not uh, of faith, of not just his faith. Revamping international institution is a must, whether it's a World Bank or IMF, WTO, in International Court of Justice, UN, and so forth, not to just become tools for superpower, must be, must be, it is, um, must take heed to, to uh, what has been said by uh, the Prime Minister Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, uh, who I might congratulate uh, Turkey because today it's their national day. He said, and I quote, the world is bigger than five. The world is bigger than five. I want you to repeat that after me, please, if you believe in it. Because in the past, we, we had five countries ruling ruling the world in the Security Council, and now we have the world is bigger than five. Nobody's speaking. Why? <laughs> Say it louder, louder. 
The world is bigger than five. The world is bigger than five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Sorry. I just, you might have noticed, a round of applause for the gentleman. I love that, that company bosses should maybe all start thinking like Formula One racers, to be nimble, efficient, but also think always about that next race. But I also think we can safely say that we've, um, we've come to the end of the, on the one hand and on the other hand, way of theorizing about the world economy. So thank you very much for that. But what I would like to say, you may have noticed that our fourth spot has now been filled. So let me introduce our next esteemed panelist. And just also talk you through how the next hour or so is going to work. Obviously, we're going to hear from each panelist in turn. But then I'm going to start quizzing them. I mean, I've got a, an arsenal of questions here. But what would be great as well is when we open it up to the floor, I hope you guys have got some questions as well. Because what we really want is a, an, an inspiring and thoughtful discussion. So we'll get that going once everyone has made their opening remarks. So. Dr. Ralph Speth, I hope you weren't in a Jaguar on your way in. Is that <laughs> London traffic? In a I know. Room, but in a traffic jam. In a traffic Sorry jam. Okay. All right. But uh, well, CEO of Jaguar Land Rover. Now, Leamington Spa and Munich are both places that he calls home. He's German, and as you can see, quite understated. But don't be fooled, because beneath this is a man with a seriously ambitious business agenda. And that's why under his stewardship, he's ach achieved an astonishing turnaround at the company, leading it from really troubled times to record profits. I think you said that Jaguar Land Rover is back. Jaguar Land Rover is in good shape. Now, innovation, I know, has played a part in that with, the new, with new products, helping revitalize the brand. But you've also held up success as a key signal of Britain's manufacturing revival as well. And we're talking thousands of jobs here in Britain out of around 20,000 worldwide. Further afield, Jaguar Land Rover has big plans for other markets, not least China. And in your words, the automotive industry is the most complex industry on earth with the most complex consumer product on earth, the car. So let's hear what he has to say. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and also, Mr. Um, Carlo Dr. thank you very much for using so many metaphors for, uh, of the automotive industry. Uh, it will help us, yes. definitely. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But you, uh, didn't hear, you didn't hear what I said earlier. I said I bought a car called Range Rover. Oh, thanks <laughs> a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. Very good decision, by the way. And uh, please, you can follow. Um, it was here in Britain that the Industrial Revolution started. But the scale of the change, and especially the technology change, across the globe is now bigger, faster, and more widespread than ever in, at any time in the last 250 years. And in his book, The New Industrial Revolution, Peter Marsh, defined the fifth industrial revolution and describes it character, uh, characterized by complex value change and the development of new fields such as nanotechnology and mass per, uh, personalization. The ability to produce uh, near unique products to a large audience using precise personal criteria. Now, some people see these current changes, the pace and the resulting potential implications as a threat. And indeed, not all of the changes and so-called improvements are contributing to a better society. However, overall, and in recognizing all these challenges, I really believe that we can make a difference and the, that we can see or I see many opportunities. Jaguar Land Rover, as you mentioned, is a British company. And we really would like to deliver a very special experience to our customers, experience our customers li uh, like uh, and love. And the compelling products we deliver is really the combination out of British design from the very best British uh, designers from the Royal College of Art, but also this world-class technology. And this combination uh, differentiates us. 
And so we at Czechoslovakia Land Rover, we really want to go for the opportunities. We want to see global expansion of both our manufacturing operational footprint, but also our sales network. We would like to develop products which are really going for the science of innovation and information, as described by Kevin Menu also in his book about making a better world, the ideas that shape the company and the country. And we really would like to use new technologies like connectivity, so that the recognizing the car at the end of the day, as you say, is, is the most complex product on earth, the most consumer uh, used product on earth. And that's the fascination of a car, because you can have all these technologies combined in a car. And by the way, it's more complex than, and does have more source codes than Apollo flying man to the moon at the end of the day. More, the car does have more source codes than a plane. Isn't it fantastic? It's great. So I strongly believe that we can prosper as we innovate more, changing faster and listening to customers better. That is how we improve. And our customers are becoming better informed about the new choices available to them and global tastes and preferences in regard uh, to premium pro uh, products are converging. Size, size can still be, uh, can still strengthen the business, quite clear. And, but nowadays, nimbleness, and I just quote you, nimbleness and agility really matter. And we are a small company in comparison uh, to the real big global players selling millions of cars. But our nimbleness and our exclusivity, we want to make to an advantage. Premium car buyers demand special customers, uh, demand special experience, demand special products. And a special company really can deliver that. And we are going to deliver these kind of experiences in round about 180 uh, markets around the world. Now we are seeing a redistribution of incomes globally. As we mentioned already, the old north-south divide weakens. The south gets richer as the developed world stagnates economically and sometimes even goes backwards. We also see the economy balance shifting with the nations as a new entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial meritocracy overtakes the old elite. These entrepreneurs increasingly are our main customer base. And I really would like to mention just another issue, which at the end of the day, uh, we all have to deal with. Business is people. Whatever we do, at the end of the day, business is people. And I expect that we will see an even more change and more changes in the age programs. And one of the big questions is, what will be the preference of Generation Y? Now, Generation Y is a customer of the future. Generation Y is going to uh, shape our business. Generation X, so we, more so to speak, are individuals, risk takers, business leaders of the day. Generation Y, under, uh, those under 30, are said to be more liberal, keener to make the world a better place. This will affect us all. And those who know how, will win. And that means in the automotive business we will need to understand the aspirations of these new customers, satisfying their demands for high performance vehicles, as well as their desire for new and different experiences. And we must also get the heart of this generation why, in order to motivate, to motivate their interests in contributing, in shaping a high performance culture in the company and also create an impatient, impatience to uh, create more and improve services and products. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Czechoslovakia Land Rover has undergone, uh, undergone profound change because we needed it. A well-loved 
um, long-standing business. It produced many technical pioneering cars, outstanding innovations such as the disc brake, pioneered by a Checo. But it was, was also uh, all over the time very often unprofitable. Mostly because it did not listen to customers, was not f too focused, uh, was too focused on the home market and not driven. And we are now owned by Tata, India's biggest privately owned conglomerate. And talk about change. We are now profitable and fast growing. And our growth is investment led and fully backed up by Tata, our parent company, and based on values. And without Tata, I have to say, we even would not exist anymore. So, therefore, we are used. We forge new relationships with partners because such collaborations are now essential for the future, for our future success. This includes Cherry in China, where we produce and will manufacture jointly a vehicle at the end of next year. Or Tata, where we have a production partnership and produce already the Jaguar F-Type or the Freelander in India. And during the last year, as you know, we signed a, a letter of intent with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in order to also think about the idea of setting up an automotive cluster, an automotive partnership in the Kingdom. And we believe that Saudi Arabia, the largest car market in the Middle East, has got the potential to become one of the world's leading center of advanced engineering, technology, and innovation. And the development of an automotive cluster in the kingdom would be a real win-win uh, for the society, for Saudi Arabia, Jaguar Land Rover, and its customers in the region. A part of the world where premium products are really in high demand. A country by the way, that combines new technologies, new supply chain opportunities, and rising consumer demand represents an attractive proposition for all of us. So it's attractive. In conclusion, we will continue to invest at well over the industry standard, well over the average in the automotive industry, in engineering solutions at all our locations, as a global footprint. And we will do so because we are quite sure that innovation and great new engineering is going to speed up the pace of change and is the absolutely key to future success. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And now we've heard how Jaguar Land Rover wants to invest in science to innovate and to prosper. One thing I think we've, we've learned so far is that to, to su survive and thrive in this tricky economic environment, these business leaders are breaking the rules, changing the rules, because I gave you all five minutes to speak. So um, let's see if we can stick to that. Hold a, hold a bit back for the discussion. <laughs> Over to you. Let's, let, let's, let's move on now. Yeah. Do, Do I still have five? Yeah, okay, you've got five I'll, I'll minutes. I'll go for five. Right. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon, peace be upon you. I'll start with uh, the word change, doing business in a changing world. So as I was listening, I said, wow, um, Khalid is saying that petrochemical businesses are moving to, to the United States because of the shale revolution. And then I heard Raf, who you know, when I was growing up, the uh, aspirational car, among others, was the Jaguar E-Type, or if you're a bit older, Tansri One and others, Tansri Razi, was, you know, Jaguar was the epitome of a, you know, little did I know that this icon of Britishness is going to be run by a German, owned by an Indian, so I don't know. And this morning, as I heard Mr. Cameron and others, and looking at the audience, at the heart of what was once the British Empire, it felt like the empire strikes back, you know, somewhat. Although it's not about striking back, this or that, we'll come to that. And yesterday, I was supposed to be here, but I decided to come a day later because of this big storm 
that uh, it's supposed to have. <coughs> so among the things we did yesterday at home, because I suddenly found I had an extra day at home, was my wife decided to send uh, some stuff to our daughter who's studying in Seattle, in Washington, in the University of Washington. She was actually sending coffee, Ipo white coffee. This is a, the Malaysian in the audience will know. You know, my daughter is somehow addicted to Ipo white coffee at the home of Starbucks and all that. So go figure, that's changing business environment. I actually have just three simple points, I think, from where we sit. Uh, Karzana, as many of you know, literally means treasure in Arabic, in Malay, in Urdu, in Farsi, in many, many languages. Uh, we, we manage basically the sovereign, one of the sovereign funds of Malaysia. Uh, basically, you know, what we do is we invest and we are judged on two things, you know, making money or earning the money. I think thankfully we've trebled the portfolio in about nine years. Mathematically inclined, we'll know that's about 12, 13% compounded rate. But there's a second part, which is uh, the stuff that we do needs to have a certain social or societal utility, create jobs, develop new industries, new economic zones, and so on. What are the big trends? There are many, some already spoken. If I could choose just three or four, the shift from west to east is quite obvious, um, and to an extent, north to south, that's one. The second big one is really uh, the domination of financialization of a global economy, really. And, you know, hence the distinction between the financial and real economy. I think this is also a big factor. Uh, the fact that, you know, just it's a big conundrum or paradox that just the mere mention of uh, tapering would actually throw markets into tailspin. Uh, you know, this is funny. Eh? When, I, when I studied accountancy and investment, a, a, a U.S. economy that's recovering is supposed to be good for markets, etc. It's the other way around now. Uh, the third trend is really demands on businesses. It's not enough just to make money and to earn it. I think obviously to do it in a, not just a socially responsible way, i.e. do no harm, is also not quite enough. People are demanding that you need to do some good as well, over and above doing no harm. So you know, this is three important trends. And the fourth is really technology. So what does this mean? I just wanted to say to us, it places a premium on many things, but on three things, maybe as an investor into many companies. Uh, we see that the premium on reputation, that means the ability to do you know, businesses, you can be tough, but you have to be fair. You have to do it you know, in a way with you know, good governance, fair dealing, et cetera. I think that's one. So if you can find business, if you run your businesses in the, not even in the long run, but in the medium run, you will get it right more often than not. And the premium for good reputation is very high. The second is, uh, you know, in the, in the investing world, you got to try and figure out what is alpha. Uh, you know, the technical stuff, there's a beta and basically alpha is outperformance against the efficient frontier of investing. Eh? Uh, to put it, just try to simplify. The geographic alpha to us, we clearly see in the east. Kazana is heavily weighted, not just in Malaysia, but in the region, in the east. Secondly, in places like Africa and Turkey, uh, uh, and then regionally, and so on. The third one is really around sectoral alpha, making your choices. I think we see the compelling trends around demographics in, in certain places. So, for example, consumer trends, not just consumer durables like car, but consumer services, for example. I think we're big into, into things like healthcare, into things like uh, mobile telephony, into things like uh, financial services, for example. And f the final point really, I'm sorry, I just ran out of time, is that in the Muslim world, I think this audience, I think there's a huge uh, amount coming from a relatively low base. I think the conference material shows us all the numbers of how intra-OIC trade, intra-OIC investment is low. I see a glass only, you know, only three quarter, a glass three quarter empty, right? Or even or even more, and really, I think to the, the point about um, the Islam is neither east nor west. We are told, and uh, finding the middle way in between what is uh, you know from socialism to different types of capitalism. Really, I think there's a wealth of stuff uh, in our traditions, and I think there's a lot of example and there's a lot to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Asma. And I think it's interesting that you're talking about alpha for you being Africa, being Turkey, especially because moving on now to Mr. Ibrahim, he, your, your investment hotspots are, are closer to home. It's here in the UK, it's Germany, it's the US, and emerging markets are not for you, are they? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Change is, a, is the only constant. So as executives, we have to deal with it and make a difference between success and failure. You need an enduring philosophy, ensuring a sustained competitive advantage, operating ethically, and have a strategy to remain competitive. Over the last 30 years, global trade expanded, bolstered by trade, liberalization, harmonization of regulation, and the opening up of the former closed economies of China and the, uh, um, Eastern Europe. This brought unprecedented growth to emerging markets. 82% of emerging market GDP comes from international trade, making emerging markets particularly vulnerable to change. Three major blocks in the uh, global economy, the first block labor-intensive countries like China, second block, value-added companies like the US, Germany, and the UK, and consumer countries like Brazil, Russia, and India. Globalization benefited all, but value-added countries lost jobs, its tax base, and that set the scene for the 2008-2007 crisis. The developed markets introduce structural reform and quantitative easing. That quantitative easing benefited the consumer countries hugely, strengthening their currencies, decreasing their weighted cost of capital, increasing liquidity, fueling consumption and wealth. But with limited reforms, subsidies on fuel and food, huge increases in labor costs, 53% over 10 years per unit, and dirty energy, massive current account deficits and budget deficits. This trade model for this emerging markets that has 82% of its GDP on average exposed to trade, this model is making them particularly vulnerable when we move from quantitative easing to tapering. The winners over the next 20 years will not be the emerging markets, but be those countries that can add value, especially the US and Germany, and why? They've reformed and liberalized, focused on their competitive advantage, their cost of production, unit labor costs has declined 15% over the last 10 years, compared to emerging markets increasing 53%. On a relative basis, that's an 80% increase. Fuel prices, Brent crude, dirty energy has increased 136% since 2008. Yet natural gas has declined 28%. Electricity in Germany has declined 20, uh, 26%. Shale gas, we heard, is clean, cheap. It is equivalent of $18 a barrel compared to Brent of 110, approximately. Renewable energy in Germany has reduced energy prices and it's cheap, clean. There's a huge investment in infrastructure, logistics, IT and telecom. The developed markets have used the crisis to improve the efficiency, produce more at home. Today, the US produces more cars at home in the US at a cyclical peak. In conclusion, countries that have become more competitive because of energy, labor and infrastructure produce the best risk-adjusted returns for corporates like ourselves. Emerging markets are incredibly vulnerable and most probably the source for the next crisis. We just have to look at North Africa, where no country had a competitive advantage, the development index was low. This creates substantial challenges, but great opportunities for CEOs like myself. As a money manager, I'm excited about the prospect of this changing environment. It allows those with a sustained competitive advantage to prosper. OASIS is focused on protecting and growing the real wealth of our Muslims. 
We focus on eliminating riba, alcohol casinos of the wealth and the pensions of Muslims. To my fellow panelists, invest with Oasis. You may have a navigation system in Oasis funds. Your timekeeping, we may have a watch for you in the Oasis fund. On a performance of 13%, the Crescent Fund has delivered the world's leading equity fund has delivered 24% per annum over 15 years. One million pounds is equivalent to 24 million pounds 15 years later with the lowest risk and the most competitive cost structures. We have proven Islamic finance works for Muslims, ordinary Muslims, at no higher cost with lower risk because our assets are asset-based, our equities are, uh, sukuks are asset-based. To the Prime Minister of the UK, Oasis says we will take between 5 and 10% of the sukuk announced today. So you've already got some demand. So we are excited about the prospect for Islamic finance. We're absolutely excited about change and we're happy to be here. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with you, Adam, because I think it's very interesting. You've almost got a topsy-turvy way of thinking about international trade. There's, if you look at a lot of recent economic reports, everyone talks about looking beyond the BRICS, talks about emerging markets. And you're saying, put that on hold and look at what everybody else has been doing to sort out their houses. So we see two huge opportunities globally. The one that kind of has gone through structural change, so, so that's the developed markets. And we have really put our money where our mouth is, so we have a very low exposure to emerging markets outside Africa. If you take shale gas, shale gas has the opportunity of transferring manufacturing from China and to the US amongst others, but it has the ability to destabilize oil producing countries because oil producing countries will not be able to be competitive at an oil price of about 30 or 40 dollars a barrel. That puts huge geopolitical risk into the system. But there's one really great undiscovered opportunity and it's in my neighborhood, Africa. African countries are growing. They most probably are where China is today, 15 years ago. So we think that Africa is a new frontier and companies like ourselves, we've invested hugely in that market. So we, we've actually invested in the developed market in old technology like telecoms, the fixed line and mobile operators with convergence, we spoke about convergence, that's the best place to be, not in Apple and not in the internet companies, but the companies that transmit the data to your homes with fiber optics using both wireless and wireline. So we're really, really excited about those countries and the growth prospects of lowering cost of living, uh, rising cost of living um, and efficiencies in Africa. So we think that Africa is a great opportunity. So places that could be playing catch up are actually very exciting. Sheikh, you've got some, something to add there? Uh, I, I am sorry, but uh, I have a, uh, a contention with your, uh, your calculation on shale gas. Shale gas will attack the gas market around the world and the coal market gradually over 20, 30 years, maybe the oil market. So, and, and besides, shale gas is priced today at $3 because it's subsidized or it's considered to be a byproduct. In the future, it cannot be considered as a byproduct, especially after America has opened up its uh, doors to export and it will be exported to China and mostly to Europe. Um, so, the price of gas will go back to its natural price of six dollars a, uh, a million BTU, which which would convert into not the eighteen dollars you're talking about. It's about sixty dollars. Thirty dollars. Huh? It's a factor of five. No, so it's no, it's not a factor of five. Okay. It's eight to ten times to bring oil to gas. So you're saying not to be spooked by the numbers right yes. now. Yes. Yes. I, th I think there's a big issue. In the, in the US, you have the pipelines in place. Yes. And with the pipelines in place, you're actually able to transmit your, the, the gas efficiently and effectively. 
And you're absolutely correct. If you have to ship and compress gas and ship it from the U.S. to the Far East, East, your cost will that drop dramatically. And you also transfer and trans to the, the U.S. Gulf Coast. And um, that's really happening in the fertilizer industry and the petrochemical industry as we talk today. In fact, in the first five years of shale gas, shale gas has effectively replaced coal as a source of energy in the U.S. Dr. Rasta. Um, I just want to come back to your question because you asked what is next, emerging markets, BRICS, after BRICS. And I say, from my, my point of view, we also have to be stable. We cannot just run for the very fast, uh, fastest moving economy because we never know whether this very famous black swan uh, already waits behind the corner. And that means, yes, we want to go for growth, but I also have to make sure that the company is protected and therefore is stabilized more around the globe. And that means at the end of the day, yes, we are selling in 180 markets around the world today, but we will want to also balance it in all the economies so that we have a very nice uh, production for the company. So not just the fast-growing economies, fast but the industrial markets the like industrial, Europe. The industrial footprint has to be solid. Well, while I've got you, let, 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 you talked quite a lot about the customer and the consumer. Where, where would you say your customer is? Because you mentioned Generation Y. But do you think that the global economic crisis has changed who your customer is and where they're going to come from? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, we see a change. For instance, the use. The use uh, does not make uh, uh, the traffic license uh, or the, the driver license very uh, uh, early. They start later. They start in a totally different behavior. They see mobility, but not car ownership. So we will see changes. But at the end of the day, uh, we are quite sure that the uh, mobility and the mobility market will grow. You mentioned that we will see uh, one to two billion cars in the next gen century. You're right. At this very moment, uh, we sell, or the automotive industry sells, around about 76 million cars per year. The forecast is going up to 100 million cars per year in around about 2020. And that gives you exactly the figures you talked about. And therefore, I guess overall mobility will highly uh, be sought after all around the world. Uh, in the future. Tansri Asman, we, you, you, you touched on quite a few themes, but I'm interested in talking about how Islamic finance can, can flourish all, all over the world. Because I know in Malaysia, you, it flourishes alongside conventional financial markets. Is it something, though, that you can export? It's not quite true. It doesn't flourish alongside. It flourishes on top of because uh, the bulk of new issuances are actually Sharia compliant. I think uh, we are moving to the third wave of Islamic finance. The first wave was about in the mid-1980s when Islamic banking was introduced. Uh, Malaysia chose a path of moving side by side at that time, at that time together with the so-called conventional system, unlike some other countries. The second wave, if you like, was around about the early 90s, where it, it funded uh, through the capital markets. A lot of the infrastructure you see today in Malaysia, power plants, highways, and so on. The third wave is really, I think, we are moving between Sharia compliant, which is basically just being, you know, comply, i.e. permissible, what's permissible, to Sharia base, which is more than that, which is trying to look at ways and means to actually use finance and typically equity-based finance in particular. I think there's many Islamic finance practitioners here will understand that difference um, you know, between debt-based and equity-based. Um, and on top of that, to actually do impact investing, for example, into, uh, let's say, to fund you know, some of the social or the issues of our times, for example, to fund affordable housing as an example, because a large part of uh, payments for mortgage, uh, actually goes to mortgage rather than the house itself, and indeed car financing for that matter. So Kazana and our companies actually, you know, I don't have the time, but you know, 
those of you interested, you know, we, we do it at seven layers, actually. That's just not too much to explain. But basically, we issue sukuks in multiple currencies. Actually, we've done the first one, maybe the first sing dollar. Uh, tomorrow, or rather Thursday, I go to Turkey to open our office in Istanbul. Deputy Prime Minister Babachan has kindly agreed to do so. We're waiting for the Turkish lira to stabilize a bit, you know, because uh, you need a stable currency to do that. Negative yields, et cetera, et cetera, no? so underlying. So, so in short, uh, you know, earlier this year, not far from here, I was, you know, honored to be invited to give a speech at the LSE on Islamic finance as a practitioner, but I'm not a scholar. And basically, my conclusion was that Islamic finance in this current world of financial turmoil is not part of the problem because you know, it practices ethical finance, but it's not quite fully part of the solution yet. You know, finance- So a work in progress, you, you're working it's on it. It's a work in progress, but you know, there's many advances. And I think the way to apply finance is in, in its correct role is actually to drive businesses rather than, you know, uh, uh, the role of finance is really to facilitate business rather than being an end in itself. I think it's where, where we kind of lost our way a little bit. Thank you. Adam, what do you think? Do you think, um, well, how important do you think Islamic finance is to enhancing international trade? I think it's very important, and I think the structures that have been put in place over the last 20 or 30 years of harmonizing rules and regulations within Muslim countries, um, getting the Sharia standards harmonized between East and West, North and South, has played a great role. And then bringing Sharia finance and rules into the conventional uh, in, uh, environment from a regulatory point of view, from a tax point of view, I think has been incredibly important. That allows for globalization, it allows for global organizations like ourselves. While we're very small, we offer a solution to Muslims wherever they are, and by doing that, if you can globalize, you can build a brand, and by bu building a brand, you can differentiate yourself through excellence. The brand has to have value, and, and the brand value of excellence, of performance, of integrity, and I think it is one way of actually encouraging trade between Muslim countries and trade across the globe with other countries. And so if you look at the um, expansion of the Sukuk market, more recently, you know, if you take Turkey and um, Indonesia, they issued Sukuks right at the uh, uh, tough times a few months ago. And the Sukuks were oversubscribed eight to 10 times. And what has happened is the heels have come right down. So it's been an attractive investment for anybody, both Muslim investors investing in Sukuk, but anybody wanting great returns that are secure because Sukuks are asset-based. So the opportunity for Islamic finance to encourage um, trade and finance and broaden and deepen trade and finance, I think is an important element. Well, talking about broadening things, um, Sheikh Ali Reza, I'd like to bring you back into the discussion because you, you talked about the digital revolution, you talked about political unrest and wars, and of course the global economic crisis. But particularly what I'm interested in is this loss of trust in previously trusted institutions. I mean, do you think that's the biggest challenge, challenge and the biggest hurdle for businesses today? Are you sure you want me to talk? Uh, I've, to I've talked enough for the whole... <laughs> and you're not angry with me. <laughs> no, We're all friends up here. Yeah. No, I, I, um, when I say trust, it's not just the, uh, the banking, the, uh, I, I go to the government, the people, the, um, everybody has become distrusting of each other. And you have to begin to work developing partnership and uh, from empirical, and not just uh, hope that this is the person that you is in front of you is trustworthy. This has uh, made um, business uh, slow down tremendously because, uh, I mean, if you want to get a visa ten, five, five, seven years ago to America, it would take you for certain countries maybe as much as six months to get it approved. And they'll interview you until you're blue in the face. So uh, that's just America. Others uh, had the same. Uh, so th they, this is what I meant by uh, post-terrorism uh, and uh, reaction to terrorism. The, uh, 
the whole trust game, the military was, people lost trust in them. They did the fiasco in, not them only, but the politicians and the, in Iraq in, and in Afghanistan and in so other countries. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yes. And you think it, it would hinge on forging partnerships. And that's interesting, actually, I'd like to bring um, you back in, Dr. Speth, because in the past you've said that nobody really understands you know, what's going on tomorrow in, in Europe or in China. And so it's important to find an element of collaboration as the best way forward for industry to be competitive. So I is that what it's all about, collaboration between government and industry? Up to a, c a certain degree, definitely, but I would like to come back to this kind of trust. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I guess what we want to have as an industry is free and fair trade. And WTO is in principle the organization to do it and to deliver it, but at the moment what we see around the world is not really free and fair trade. Regulations, duty, whatever comes oh, they, out. They know how to talk about it an yeah. awful lot. Yeah. So, and I guess that if we can change that, would help a lot. And then moving on, do you think it's, it's crucial to have that collaboration between governments and industry? Yeah, or absolutely. Is it about more? No, no, it's uh, absolutely big, uh, bit, uh, in between uh, government and industry. But what I even would like to say, uh, in addition to academia, to the education, because at the end of the day, what we want to have is we want to be internationally competitive. Being com competitive means we have to have state-of-the-art solutions for customers around the world, and that means we have to bear, have the best labs, the best education, the and best, best uni people. Uh, universities in order to be competitive, and therefore we need a collaboration between governments, industry, supply, supply chain, and academia. I've got so much more I want to talk to you, but I'm very conscious that there are lots of you out there with questions. So let's open it up to the floor. Does anyone, else, does anyone out there have a, a question for any of our panelists so we can bring you all in? Second row here, yeah. If you could um, stand up, if you could, if someone could get a microphone to the lady here, if you could introduce yourself, first of all, and then address your question. Yes, we have microphones actually placed at certain parts of the room. So when you have a question, you have to get up and go to the microphone. It won't come to you. Right. Salam alaikum. Um, I'm Janice Bonham, Director of Arts and Culture um, for the Inner City Muslim Action Network based in Chicago, Illinois. And um, thank you for all of your great words. I heard a, f a few things. Um, you were talking a lot about collaboration and new and different experiences and trust and generation wires and social responsibility. And I'm very curious as to what any of you think that arts, culture, and tourism um, have in a place of economic growth, especially since you're mentioning building social bridges and um, arts and culture has done, um, made great strides in that, especially since, you know, 9-11. And then also um, those resources and products and trends with tourism and um, art and culture making a lot of these different spaces places and products more attractive. Um, what were your thoughts on that? Asman, let's start with you. Yeah, I think spot on. I think um, just a small anecdote. Um, round about the, the uh, Lehman crisis in 2008, my team sat down and I threw them a challenge. Find a sector that will create jobs. Find a sector as the more the world globalizes the more the local stuff actually becomes more valuable with the proviso that we take care of those local endowments, you know, arts, culture, eco, our eco endowments and so on and so forth. And hey presto, through a funneling uh, process, our team came up with leisure and tourism. Uh, there's about 30 subsectors. I think the Malaysian brand, Malaysia Truly Asia, I think is well known. But uh, we kind of drilled down to about three or four uh, among other things, for example, eco-based. So we've got some beautiful resorts that preserves the environment. These are 80 million year old uh, rainforests, by the way. And you throw in, you know, ecologists right in the middle of that. Uh, we came up with uh, um, theme parks, actually, interestingly, because that actually creates lots of jobs. So, so this is now also happening in a big way. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, geographically, we're quite close to many centers, for example, North Asia, where the spending power is there, it's coal, 
and you can almost arbitrage geographically with Southeast Asia. Uh, Indonesia, for example, is a big market affluence and so on. So I could go on and on, but arts and culture certainly, I think, is actually, if you think about it, an antidote to a lot of stuff around, you know, it's, it's cutthroat, the nature of cutthroat business in you know, auto industries or petrochemicals, etc. is so great. But countries, uh, communities are sitting on such endowments, intangibles often, but also tangibles like you know, rainforests and other uh, uh, are sitting on, on a lot there. And this is actually a guarantee of a you know, future, uh, you know, not just uh, profits, but also bringing uh, in a socially inclusive way. So 100%. Let's, Chicago let's has take a lot another of culture question. Too. Let's take another Thank question. You. Yes, would you just make your way there to the microphone? And while you're doing that, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. Moin Yassin from Global Vision 2000. Did you, did you I just, must just hold on one, just one moment one because second. Dr. Speth has a couple of Because I just wanted to add, uh, just add something quickly to your question. You can really have tourism and journeys in art and with culture to the utmost areas on the planet with our most capable products. Or a Range Rover or a Range Rover Sport, and you can drive in culture with okay, a Jaguar. Sorry Next question. about it. <laughs> Good luck to you. Next question. Uh, yes, my point was there is a need for more vision and urgency in this debate. And specifically, I would congratulate uh, uh, Sayyid Khalid Al Ali Reza as an industrialist who's at Cloud 5, I think you said, as opposed to Cloud 9, talking about a paradigm shift. Uh, and really putting his money where his mouth was by saying that Islamic social capitalism is the way forward. However, we need to um, conceptualize what does that mean? There is a battle within Islamic finance, and let's not uh, hide away from that issue. Should we invest in speculative casino initiatives to make quick return, or should we develop a socially productive economy which means we need to invest billions into a new Marshall Plan, into education systems, which develop skills. So your question is, should we be investing in casinos? Thank you. Adam, no, no, my you point is that we need, what does this new paradigm shift mean? We need to develop and invest in, in human capital in our countries in partnership so that our people can do the jobs for the century. And I would like... Khaled Ali Reza to further develop that because we also need new banks which are ethically motivated and which focus on the SMEs which are wealth creation focused. Thank, 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 you, you. For, thank you for your comments. Um, Adam, should we be investing in casinos? Should we be looking yes, beyond the norm? Yeah. I haven't found casinos that are Sharia compliant, so definitely not. So the not. answer is no. So <laughs> I think it's the, the incorrect question um, uh, yeah. on that. Um, so really, we are focused on education because when you talk about Islamic finance, you have to go down to the, the, house, the household and you have to bring people up to speed with taking ownership of their wealth, their pension, which is the major asset when they retire, they have to live off this, and it's also the major risk. And as countries struggle to meet their budgetary needs, those pensions are being cut. And so our job, one, is to educate, and the more we educate, we can broaden the base and make sure that people are independent, and that make sure people take ownership of their future, and in doing that, we create jobs, and so it's a huge amount of education and job creation if we work together. And the harmonization that has happened is encouraging that. So today, if um, we can buy UK Sukuks, we can buy Malaysian Sukuks, we can buy Saudi Sukuks, the, what are we doing? We're lowering the cost of capital, we're broadening the cost of capital, we're reducing the risk, and we're creating a stable environment. When you have stability, you can encourage growth. And when you encourage growth, you encourage employment. And when you encourage employment, you encourage wealth distribution. Sheikh Ali Reza, your response to the gentleman. Well, uh, I think uh, the devil is in the details. Um, I don't want to define it because then it will become my definition. I would like uh, people to understand that Islam is very well defined. 
an Islamic, when I said Islamic capitalism with a social, uh, uh, with a social conscious, meaning that you have to be CSR, uh, develop, not, not just go after the money and the profit, also be sure that your environment is correctly looked after, every aspect of it. I don't think that the, I've taken enough time in the past uh, half an hour or an hour, and I'm sure Juliet is not going to allow me to speak longer than what I had just I said. I do wish we had more time because you're right. There, there is much more meat to get our teeth into. But let's leave it. Let's I think we have time for one more question. Is the mic on? Yeah. Okay, good. In 1977, I attended an Islamic um, conference sponsored by Rebita. And during that conference, uh, Dr. Eric Williams, which is the prim premier of um, Trinidad, asked a very poignant question, which I would want to re um, uh, revisit for this conference. And that was, why was it that the, uh, the Europeans, uh, actually the ones who colonized and developed North America, North and South America, at a time when the Muslim world actually was stronger? He asked that question. And when you understand the dynamics of that period, um, the loss of Andalusia and the confusion, much like the 2008 confusion that we had, uh, it seems that right now we're almost at a similar precipice of trying to determine um, what direction our financial or our momentum should be. And, and in context, the European uh, expansion was catering to a need. It, it, was, it actually was financing an undeveloped, it was an undeveloped resource, and it did that. It was out financing, which actually brought strength to Europe. So the, the, I guess the poignant question here is in terms of examining ourselves is whether you focus on trying to internally build and behold entrepreneurship within the Muslim world, or whether we look at out out financing, and I consider for places like, for example, Africa, underdeveloped portions of Africa, and many other places, as, 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 as resources to actually out finance, which actually also creates opportunity within, within the country. So I just want to just put it hooked as a question in, in, in what I just mentioned. Hasman, do you have a response to that? I'm not quite sure I understood not, the question. What the question was. Okay. The, the, the question is uh, whether or not in our determination of Islamic financing, whether we look at it as, as a means for retooling and all the uh, industries within the Muslim world, or whether we look outside, for example, in places like Africa, looking for infrastructural development in underdeveloped or undeveloped countries, and use that as a resource to also build okay, there, got it. and also uh, build your own countries. Internally. But along with, but, but with that comes a human, a human element of being able to do something good. Okay, um, pretty, pretty deep, maybe a good way to end the day even. Um, I think what, what triggered when you started about European, uh, the age of exploration, colonization, uh, you know, lots of scholars have written, but my, my take on that was in the context of the Muslim world. I mean, Muslims, we were ahead in terms of technology, mathematics, you name it. Uh, the fall of Al-Andalus and, and uh, other parts of the empire, uh, I think, you know, we got basically complacent, like all great powers get complacent. And, you know, the Europeans in their age of exploration had to go far, Vasco da Gama and all that, right? Because the Mediterranean Silk Road were all controlled by Muslims. So they had the pioneering spirit of exploration, innovation, collaboration, whatever. Of course, some may argue a narrative of you know, guns, God, and I can't remember, germs, and a few other things. Uh, never mind. I think in the context of today, maybe to me, I, you know, I talk about the big trends, financialization of the economy. I come from the financial world as just Adam and so on, and it's a struggle sometimes. I think the, you know, five years after Lehman, banks are even bigger, even stronger, even, you know, larger to fail, too big to fail and all that. Eh? I think, I think we press home the point, it's not just Islamic finance per se, it's Islamic economics. Uh, I just wanted to relate, we had the great pleasure actually in Malaysia to host uh, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, uh, recently in KL, 
on an Islamic or rather ethical finance platform. And there's a lot of similarities between you know, Islamic finance, so-called, and ethical finance or stable finance, whatever you want to call it. I think these are universal values. I just wanted your point about, I thought after the Second World War, after the First World War, Lord Keynes wrote a great piece you know, saying the economic consequences of peace. Basically saying you're going to do the next war if the winners, uh, i.e. the Allied powers you know, on Germany and so on were too great, right? So, and lo and behold, those conditions of being too much on top created you know, the rise of Hitler, Mussolini and so on. Now all that is history. Second World War, I thought the great thing the West did was come up. Of course, there was some self-serving or rather you know, normal interest. Marshall Plan was about you know, winners over losers, helping, etc. I'm afraid I don't see that kind of magnanimity, that kind of uh, you know, charity even, not enough at least. Eh? I think maybe to our brothers here to appeal, I mean, Islam is not just for Muslims. Eh? Islam is for everyone and we need to collaborate and work together. I mean, this, the core principles of a, of a socially inclusive distributive system, I think the biggest issue is not about growth or production. The biggest issue, I have no doubt, in the United States will grow, I have no doubt all this technology is going to grow. The issue is inequality. So since you started about Tottenham two years ago, I saw a headline that says, Tottenham on fire. And I said, season hasn't started, it turned out to be the riots north of here. Actually so we've got to solve that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You know, I, when I came here today, I thought, well, we're going to have some solutions. We'll, we'll, I'll know where to invest my money, um, and we'll be able to predict where the world economy is going. But I think, unfortunately, it's still a very gray area. What we have learned, though, about is how Islamic finance can maybe enhance international trade. We've, we've, we've heard about how people are important, investing in the people, having the right kind of culture within the business, how we also can't really predict what's going on and can't say for sure, right, this is the world power, that's where things are moving. It's very transient and it keeps changing. So in short, we've got to be on our toes and if we listen to Dr. Speth, by Jaguar Land Rover. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to Shay Kelly Reza, Dr. Rafi, um, Rafe Speth, Tan, San, Tansri Asman, and Adam Ibrahim. Thank you very much. They've been a fantastic panel, haven't they? Thank you very much. <laughs>